Welcome back to the channel. Today I have a special treat for you. This is Nick from a company called Jump7. Nick is a fantastic sales agent who deals with everything to do with retailing your product. And today we're going to focus on pricing. Now, loads of entrepreneurs and startup businesses get their pricing structures wrong. So you're going to want to make sure you watch until the end of this video to find out how to avoid the common mistakes. I'm thrilled to have Nick with us today to shed some light on how to price your product correctly. Let's kick this off by talking about the biggest mistake that entrepreneurs and startups make when pricing a product. The most common mistakes people make is understanding how little you have to make that product for compared to the retail price. So for example, if you're selling a product whose RRP or MSRP is £10, you need to be dividing that cost by four or five to target your manufacturing cost. So in that example, 10 pounds or $10 say, then actually if you divide that by five, you've got to make that product for two pounds or $2. That's right. And it can be quite a shock because you may be thinking it's your first product you're developing. It's a $10 product. It's a 10 pound product. If I'm making it for six or seven pounds, I can make a profit. That would be a mistake. Mm. And you need to be targeting two, three pounds maximum for a 10 pound product to be able to make profit, whether you're selling it via retailers or direct to consumer, because there is a cost to driving people to your website if you're selling it direct to consumer or on Amazon, for example. And if you're selling it to retailers for a 10 pound product, you're probably going to need to sell it to them, the retailer, for approximately four to five pounds. So you need to be making it for probably two to three pounds maximum to, for you to make a good profit and to make money out of your business. Yeah, so to have anything left at all in terms of profit out of that, right. you've got to make it for about two pounds, you're selling it to the retailer for about four pounds, and then the retailer's going to mark it up because I guess they've got shops and they've got staff and all they that kind costs, of thing. Yep. They've got all their costs, and then you've got to add the VAT on top of that as that's well. Right. So that's where all that difference goes. Wow. So for most people, that, as you say, is quite a big shock, and you've got to actually be making the product really quite cost effectively. But talk to us a little bit about how you price the product and how you determine whether it's a £10 product or maybe whether it's a £15 product. Because obviously, in that scenario, if it's a £15 product, it could make all the difference between it actually working. It can. And I think eventually, if your manufacturing cost is slightly higher than you wanted it to be, one opportunity is to push the retail price up, the RRP or the MSRP in America, push it up a little bit. But it's got to be within the bounds of acceptability by, of consumers. So one tip I would give is, once you've got your product idea in your head, or maybe you have a prototype of it, try and ask some people, preferably not direct family and friends, because they may give a biased opinion of what you want to hear, but try and go out into the world, ask some people on the street or some colleagues or whatever, what typical price or range of prices do you think is acceptable for this product? And that range is important. It, not all products have to be sold at the cheapest end of the spectrum or the yeah. most expensive end of the spectrum. There's actually some theory and research done by a person called Van Westendorp, which we can share a bit more about, how that many products have an acceptable range of pricing. It doesn't have to be fixed on one area. And for example, when you buy some products in the UK, they cost a lot more than they would if you buy them in America yeah, and vice yeah. versa. So understand that acceptable range and then your manufacturing price will work in line with that. Okay, and I just would add to that, if you're going to start talking to people about your products, make sure either you've got your patent or register design in, in place first, or that you've got confidentiality agreements, obviously. You don't want to give away your intellectual property as part of that process. That's right, and also sometimes when you're thinking about explaining your product or selling your product, think about the benefits your product yeah. will bring, or the points of difference. Don't just talk about the features, and that, that can be for packaging or promotion packs and marketing material, but that's always an, an important thing because sometimes the product by itself may not sound like it's got enough value in it, but if you explain the benefit it gives, yeah, then that's really valuable. I was working on a product recently which was enabling a baby to sleep longer or be more comforted or not screaming and crying. And so the product did that job, yeah. but the benefit was a happier, more rested baby and also happier more rested parents. Indeed, and that is probably yeah, far more valuable for yeah. someone than actually exactly. just the kind of technical elements of the product, so that's critical. And I guess if you're doing your price research and you're not expressing the benefits well enough, then actually you could find that people aren't prepared to pay enough for the product to make it viable. Right. 
So what you want to do is get your marketing messaging and your benefits, all that stuff really well crafted so that actually then you're getting a true reflection on what people are prepared to spend on your product. That's right. And using that baby example, if you're on a long haul flight and your baby's crying and screaming, I reckon most people pay nearly anything yeah, to make the baby quiet for those of nine hours. Yeah, absolutely. So if I am an entrepreneur with a new product and I'm thinking about how I'm going to price it, obviously we've started to cover what to do, but specifically then what steps would you take to get to the sensible retail price to start selling that product? Yeah. So if you're working with a product design agency like your company D2M, they will help you bring that product to life from your mind or your piece of paper into life. And either through someone like D2M or your own contacts, you need to find a factory or company to make the products and they will ultimately give you a cost per unit manufactured. And if you can find out what that would be or the range of prices that would be, that allows you to build your pricing from there. So that would be a very good first step to get to what you think is an acceptable range of end consumer pricing at the RRP. There's no point making a product if 99% of people aren't going to buy it or in that particular market. Absolutely. And I think from a design perspective, what I would say is actually, if you've got an experienced senior designer who is designing for cost-effective production from the outset, then you're far more likely to have a commercially successful product. If you've got a junior designer who's got no real experience of production, you could end up with them designing in all sorts of parts and features and assembly processes that actually are going to cost the earth and mean the whole thing's not viable. So actually, it's pretty critical to have the right designer making sure your product's cost effective. I think that's right. And if you're looking to keep the product to a budget, then you may, although you may in your dreams want every single feature known to mankind in the product, it may be sensible to not design a Ferrari equipment, but a BMW, Audi or Mercedes would be more than acceptable. Yeah. So you keep that product within the range of pricing you need to make it work for the consumers. Okay. And you touched on pricing ranges earlier. I can't remember the name you use of the pricing structure now. Can you talk us through that a little bit more in terms of how you would set the kind of RP? Yeah. Was it Van Westendorp? Van that Westendorp. was the one, yeah. So there's some theory done on that. We can share some more of that. But essentially, Van Westendorp's theory is there's an acceptable range of pricing for a product. For example, for a product that ends up being a £30 product or a $30 product, that product may also sell very well for up to $40. And it would sell maybe even more units for down to $20 or £20. And the balance is making you profit as a, as a supplier or manufacturer of those goods that you may, for example, if you sold 10,000 units at the £30 mark or the $30 mark, you may only sell 9,500 at the $40 or £40 mark, but that actually might bring you more profit into the business. Yeah. Whereas if you sold it for £20 or $20, you'd sell more units, but you'd make less profit. So there may be an acceptable price range for that product for the consumers to pay you, but where do you make more profit as a business, which after all is what most people want. It can be a fun journey, absolutely, but you want to make profit. You want to make money out of your business, whether you're selling through retailers, through distributors, or direct to consumer. So if you did your research, I guess you could start to work out what that curve looked like for your product in terms of potential volume sold and price. And then if you work with a manufacturer, they could give you different prices depending on the volumes you're gonna order. And I guess then you can weigh those two up and decide, okay, this is the price we're gonna start selling at. Yeah, and that's one it's a great point for when you work with a factory or someone making your goods, Typically, there's one crucial question you want to ask them, which is what is their minimum order quantity or MOQ for short? So most factories will say our minimum order quantity for making you any product is a thousand units or 10,000 units. You need to find out what that is. But the great news is whatever price point they give you at that minimum order quantity threshold will become cheaper depending on how much volume you make. So if, you, if the minimum order quantity is 1,000 units, the price will be there. But suddenly if you're making 10,000 units, the price will fall. If you're making 50,000 units, the price will fall further. So over time, as you build up your business, make more products, more sell through, your cost of manufacturing becomes less and your business becomes more profitable. Yeah. And I think the other thing that I would say is that it isn't always therefore possible to make much profit on your first order. Sometimes you have to accept that actually your first order is making you no money but it's about getting into the market, it's about getting some sales under your belt, 
and getting higher volumes then for the next order where you will then be able to make some profit. And I think it was Theo Fetus off Dragon's Den in the UK who basically said he never makes any money off the first order on a first product. <laughs> it really is because the volumes aren't high enough and the margins on consumer products are so tight anyway that until you've got higher volumes, you're not going to make the profit. Yeah, that's right, Phil. And I think sometimes people forget that the lifeblood of your business is what we call the reorders. So it's the retailers coming back to you and saying, yes, I want to buy more of your product again and again. The first order is the most tough one to get. Yeah, that's true. Um, but as your volumes build, your pricing becomes cheaper, so you make more profit. And it's just easier business to, to win. Yeah. We promised at the beginning of the video to share a real life example. This is the Arc Pushchair product that I launched four or five years ago. And I'd love your opinions on the pricing of it, Nick. I think we got it wrong. So we actually priced this product initially at £900 and we did it by competitor pricing. So we didn't take our unit cost and multiply it by 4.2, which is the ratio in terms of the margins for the nursery sector on a premium product like that. What we did instead was go, well, what are the competitors priced at? And we will price comparatively. Okay. And we said, we've got better features and we've got natural fabrics and they haven't and all this type of thing. We ought to be able to charge basically what they're charging. And so we priced it at 899. But the problem we had was we just did not get enough units sold. Okay. <laughs> and as you said previously, that is the real lifeblood for the business. And we were told at the time, and part of the reason for doing that was we were told that you can't ever increase your prices. So wherever you want to be price-wise, you've got to start at. And that was the advice we took, and that's why we went in at £900. But I think it was a massive mistake because we just didn't get the volume of sales. So what do you reckon? I think there is especially in the last two years with inflation creeping up in the UK and across the Western world. I think buyers, and that's both consumers and the retailers buying off you, they are become much more, I don't want it, but it's become more understandable this is happening, that prices are going up. Yeah. So the retail prices of products are going up. And I think if you need to push up your price to a retailer, for example, or to the consumer, it's become more acceptable. It was yeah. tougher to do that five years ago. But I would say, so you can be a bit more flexible in pricing. And if you're pricing up in different countries, you can have also, for example, in Scandinavia, like places like Sweden and Norway, products cost much more there compared right. to UK or North America. So you can price it up there and maybe make a bit more profit. Okay. Whereas in yeah. some markets, you may need to price it up a little bit cheaper to get the wheels rolling. Yeah. But I've also have found situations where in your first go into the market, you're pricing up a little bit higher than you might want to be and you can always bring your product pricing down so i think there is the these days a bit more flexibility to go up or down i think pushing it up has become a bit more acceptable in the last two years because costs have gone up yeah um, true. but i've also had products that over time you can put a discount on them or you could have a black friday deal so maybe the normal retail price is 20 pounds or 20 dollars maybe for a one day promotion to get some drive some sales you've got a bit more room to maneuver if you price it up at a slightly higher level than maybe you know, you normally do. Okay. Yeah, and no, I think that's really wise. The other problem I think that we hadn't anticipated, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, is that we were priced at a similar level to some really big established brands, right. had products already in that sector who'd been selling for 20 years. And I think one of the issues was that people said, for the £900, we could have this unknown brand, <laughs> or we could have this product that has right. been around by this brand who's well established and has got loads of reviews online and everything else. And I think we then found it very difficult, and our retailers found it very difficult to get those sales. So that is a challenge with any new business, any new brand that you may be competing against more established competition. One thing I found that you can do, which isn't everything, but it helps give some credibility, is what I call independent validation of your product or brand. So that might be, for example, not necessarily a consumer review, although those are still valuable, but if you can get, for example, a well-known magazine or newspaper or website who, who made do a product review of your product and it's a positive one, yeah. you can then use that in your selling in your speaking to retailers and say, look, it's not just me saying our product's good and it's got these benefits. This company, this magazine or newspaper or media outlet also said it was great and gave it a five-star rating, for example. Yeah. That helps boost your credibility. And it's exactly the same reason that when big Hollywood movies are launching a movie, for example, on the ads all around town, on the bus stop ads, on the big banner ads, 
or in the newspapers, for example, they might say, new film, five star Empire Magazine, yeah. or five star The Times newspaper, because it's someone else saying the movie is great, apart from the movie yeah. producers themselves. And they still all do it because it gives that credibility and someone else saying that the movie is great. And it's the same yeah. when you launch a product, you can get someone else saying your product's fantastic, that builds trust and helps you combat that challenge about taking on larger brands. Yeah, that's really good advice and something that we probably should have done more of. I guess the other thing we could have considered is to price more competitively, maybe gone in at 699 right. and made it maybe a bit easier then for our independent retailers and people to sell that product because they could say, look, actually this is 200 pounds cheaper than the bugaboo or the mm -hmm. other baby or whatever else the customer was considering. Yes, we would have made less margin, but as you said in that kind of curve, maybe the increase in volume would have helped us then get the price down on future batches. Yeah, and then as you become more established as a brand, you can push the, the pricing up a little bit. Yeah. So there's different ways of doing it. Yeah, and I think that being able to push the price up is a critical thing. We were told we couldn't do that, but actually, and maybe that was true five, six years ago, but as you said, I think now certainly price increases are becoming a daily occurrence in some cases. Yeah. And I think it's therefore much more acceptable. I would say it's better to start lower, get the volume coming through, get the brand recognition, get people pushing, in this case, your push chair around so other people are seeing it. And actually all that is more valuable than getting a little bit extra margin on the first batch. That's right, and you can get that word of mouth going one mum tells yeah. the next mum they got it in the playground and they sit, what's that? You know, that and suddenly your features, which are beneficial to the parent or baby, would have resonated more and then they yeah. go and buy it. And you know, someone like Bugaboo, they can charge more and they're probably making their product for cheaper than you would have done. But so once you're established, you can push the prices up because people want that, want that brand. Yeah, indeed. And I also underestimated, I think, the power of celebrity. So quite a lot of people bought push chairs based on the fact it was a well-known brand and they'd seen some often minor celebrity pushing it in Hello Magazine or anything else. And one other quick tip on that, and one of the early brands I worked on actually with my own business, we wanted to get a celebrity or brand ambassador, we would call it. And we looked at really well-known people in the UK like Tess Daly, but it cost us far too much money to get that. Yeah. So what we did was we found someone who was not as high a profile, but had a background and interest in our product area. Okay. So for example, if you were launching a pet product, could you go and get a well-known sort of TV vet who's not as an A-list celebrity? Yeah. They might have a personal interest in getting involved in that sort of thing or representing you when, if you get onto a TV program, they could represent your brand or say it's a good product. So you might find someone in your particular niche yeah. that is not too expensive to use, but you can, again, hang your hat on that and say, oh, this particular expert in your field endorses or says the product is fantastic that's great thank you so much nick if you found this video helpful if you got value out of it please do subscribe to the channel please do hit like it makes a massive difference and if you've got any questions stick them down in the comments we reply to all questions personally